All right, hello, hello guys. Today we're talking all about altitude training for hikers and mountaineers. And specifically, if simulated altitude training in a chamber or a tent is an effective way at pre-acclimatizing you before the mountain and helping reduce the incidence of altitude sickness. So we all know that high altitude adventures are getting more and more popular and more and more accessible to more and more people. And Attitude sickness and performing on the mountain are rightfully a major concern. There's many stories every single year of people dying on these mountains, of getting into serious situations, of really just failing in these major adventures that they set their eyes out to be. They might be the fittest people in the world. They might have done all this training, but attitude just gets the better of them. And the common response to this is if you struggle, if you're going into a high attitude environment, you should spend as much time in high attitude as you can before. So you could go on training hikes or training runs up in the mountains at altitude. You should spend days or weeks prior to your trip being at a moderate altitude to help you pre-acclimatize you before the actual trip. That's pretty common sense. Most people are aware of this, but it's not incredibly practical for many, many people. There might be someone who's living somewhere like Sydney in Australia, where I am, where absolutely zero altitude can be found anywhere in the country. So saying to go train in the mountains and pre-acclimatize you is just not going to happen. Alternatively, it might be someone who had runs a super busy life and they might not be able to spare the time to get over to their country or into the trip a week early or two weeks early or whatever it may be. Or they might even be in a worse situation where they're trying to cram in their time and their trip, reduce their acclimatization time so they can fit in a small window. All of these situations do happen every single day. And rightfully, many people are trying to find a solution to help them up at attitude with this. And in this situation, simulated attitude training is a bit of a shining light. Many people are stressed about this, they're anxious about this, they're worried about this, and then they see simulated attitude training, they're hearing stories, they're seeing studies, they're seeing things um, online saying sleeping in a tent or training in a chamber can help pre-climatize you, can help prepare you for attitude, and therefore you don't have to get up on the mountains, you don't have to spend extra time, but you can shorten that time on your actual trip and be in a safe position. Now, this type of training has claimed benefits of everything from improving the, um, reducing the chance of attitude sickness in all its ways and forms to improving muscle power. But when you actually look at the evidence and look at the science and look at the research behind this, it's often very, very conflicting. And while it's often pushed as a magic bullet and a magic solution for many hikers and mountaineers, the actual practical uses of it is very, very conflicting when it comes down to the evidence. So today we're going to be exploring specifically the claims around attitude sickness and whether or not this type of training and this type of um, preparation can help you in this situation. What we're going to be covering is number one, what attitude training actually is. So you can understand the difference between terrestrial, hyperbaric and normobaric attitude training, which is incredibly, incredibly important. Number two, how commercially, commercial attitude ch ch chambers and tents work. So what's actually going on? How does it simulate attitude? Can simulate attitude training help prevent attitude sickness? And I'm going to talk you through a range of different studies to give you a good understanding of this. Um, whether or not hikers and mountaineers should consider simulated attitude training in their preparations and where it would fit into a normal preparation. And hopefully by the end of this, you can have a really good thorough understanding around simulated attitude training and whether or not it's right for you. So to start with, what is attitude training? Well, since the 1800s, Alpinist and mountaineers have known spending time at attitude will help their bodies adapt to cope, the demand, cope with the demands of their mountaintop adventures. It's pretty common knowledge these days. If you spend more time at altitude, you're going to acclimatize, you're going to perform better at the mount, on the mountain. Um, for decades, athletes have lived and trained at altitude as a way to improve their performance at sea level. And that's a pretty commonly accepted fact that if you can train in an altitude environment and go back to sea level in an endurance sport, you're going to perform better. There's three types of altitude environments you can train in. Number one is terrestrial attitude, which is basically natural attitude. This is what you're going to find on the mountain. What happens, the higher you go, the air pressure drops. That means causes the oxygen particles in the air to disperse, meaning every single breath you take in, there's less oxygen, and that puts a real strain on the body. That's natural attitude, and that's what you're going to experience when you're actually up on the mountain. The first type of simulated attitude training is something called hyperbaric attitude in which this it tries to create as very, very similar as possible environment, which simulates the effects of a mountaintop. So what will happen is you'll either go into a chain, um, steel chamber or a steel tent, a vacuum pump will suck air out at a constant rate, and that'll drop the air pressure in that particular environment. And that'll cause pretty much the same things that are happening when you're up on the mountain. Now, it's very, very clear this type of env environment in a hyperbaric attitude chamber is not really what's commonly available to hikers and mountaineers. Usually this is reserved for pilots, 
for um, research purposes or for elite athletes. And this isn't the thing that you're going to typically come across. What you will come across is something that's called normobaric altitude training. And this is pretty significantly different to those first two examples. This is what you're going to come across in the normally commercially available chambers and tents. And that's what we're going to be exploring today in a little bit more detail. Now, I very briefly mentioned right now is attitude masks. So those big black masks that you put on which restrict your breathing are just not a form of attitude training. They're claimed, many people commonly believe they're gonna help you up at attitude, but they do not play in. They have no benefits for a high attitude adventurer. And if you're using them to improve your breathing performance for high attitude, there's much more better and effective and efficient ways. So if you're thinking about masks, we're not covering that today. We'll do that in a separate lecture, but they're not considered a form of attitude training. Now, as I mentioned before, normal barrack attitude is what's most, it's what most commercially available attitude chambers and tents produce. And that's very, very important to know. So how do these actually work, these normal barrack attitude chambers, which you're going to come across in an attitude gym or if you hire a tent? Basically, nitrogen is pumped into a chamber or a tent. This reduces the percentage of oxygen in the air. This reduces your blood oxygen saturation levels, which is a similar rate to natural attitude. And this is thought to simulate a range of adaptations, which is going to help you on the mountain and basically pre-acclimatize you before you go. Now, important points to note here is the beer pressure or the barometric pressure does not change here. So what's changing is the percentage of oxygen in the air, which does not change at natural attitude, but, and the air pressure stays the same. So it cannot be considered the same as natural attitude. And as I said there, therefore, Terrestrial altitude and simulated altitude training in a normal barrack environment cannot be considered the same thing because there is no change in air pressure. And that's where so many mistakes are made, whether it's in the research, whether it's in the understanding, whether it's in mountaineers themselves, or whether it's the people pushing these products, they just do not understand that these two things cannot be considered the same. And I've seen many times that um, research papers and evidence have been supporting altitude training for people and they've been pushed on and saying, um, pushing on people saying this proves normal barrack attitude training works when this comparing two different types of attitude training. And it's very, very important to understand that distinction. So now let's explore simulated attitude training and attitude sickness, because that's the big claim which I want to go into today. Now, at first glance, there does seem to be a bit of evidence to suggest that simulated attitude training can help pre-acclimatize people, reduce the risk of attitude sickness, and improve your performance on the mountain. If you just do a quick um, Google search on this, they'll come up with a few studies and you'll be like, you know what, sweet ass, like that's awesome. That's a really, really great application of my training, dollars well spent, and I'm going to do it. But if you go into it a little bit deeper and you explore it a little bit deeper and you understand the distinctions that I was mentioning before, this is often misleading evidence. And today I'm going to explore after this a number of studies which are often quoted by people pushing these products who are often trying to use it to, as evidence that these things work in the best ways possible. I'm just going to explore, explore these studies a little bit detail so you can understand what's going on. So to start with, and let's start with this study, sleeping in moderate hypoxia at home for the prevention of acute mountain sickness. Basically, this took 76 people and they slept 14 nights um, at a average target altitude of 3000 meters. And then four days later, their AMS scores and incidents of AMS were assessed during a 20 hour exposure. And basically what they concluded at the end that for sleeping for 14 consecutive nights in a normal barrack hypoxia, equivalent to 2,600 meters, um, reduced symptoms and incidence of AMS four days later at exposure to four and a half thousand meters. Which if you read that, you're like, awesome. 14 days sleeping in a tent is going to reduce my incidence of AMS at four and a half thousand meters. That is amazing. And why would I not apply that into my training? That's probably cost effective. That's going to um, count as pre-climatization. And a lot of people I have seen use this study to justify their use of tents. However, very, very important point to make here is at no point was anyone in this study actually went up to natural attitude. What they did when they were testing the instance of AMS, they did an exposure in normal barrack attitude again. So what this study basically proves is yes, sleeping in a normal barrack attitude chamber for 14 um, nights can reduce symptoms and incidence of AMS, but only in a normal barrack attitude environment. Meaning this is gonna reduce your um, risk of AMS, in more simulated attitude training. There is no evidence to suggest that's gonna help you up on the mountain. And it's very, very important to be aware of that. So this study, yes, it does show promising results. And yes, it could be could look really great, but it doesn't really show too much for the mountain. 
Next one, intermittent altitude exposures reduced acute mountain sickness at 4,300 meters. So this one basically um, took not a huge amount of people. I think it was only six people. And they did a 30-hour thir uh, exposure at 4,300 meters at an equivalent air pressure. Um, and they did a three week period of intermittent altitude exposure beforehand. So they're spending four hours a day for five days a week at the equivalent of 4,300 meters. And at the end of that three week period, they went 30 hours in an altitude equivalent barometric pressure and they had a look at the results. Now, what they did at the end, they concluded that after three weeks of intermittent altitude exposure, um, it provided a really effective alternative to chronic altitude residents, meaning spending extra time at altitude at reducing the instance and severity of AMS. So that's basically saying if you can spend three week period, four hours a day, five days a week, it's going to help you up on the mountain. And that's really, really great. That's great news. And that's absolutely amazing. But the important thing to be aware of here is this test was done in a hyperbaric altitude chamber which basically reduced that air pressure, simulated that natural attitude very, very closely and showed these results. So it's saying if you can have access to a hyperbaric attitude chamber, then doing this, um, this protocol, it will reduce the instance of severity of AMS. However, most people don't have access to these hyperbaric environments. So that's, again, I've seen people use this study to justify their normal barrack attitude training, but it's not the same thing. So this does show promising results for hyperbaric attitude training. It might not prove anything, but it's very, very promising results, but it cannot be considered the, two, the same thing. Now, this one was actually done before climbing Mount Everest, which is really amazing because studies of people actually on the mountain are pretty rare just because of the cost and the issues and all yada yada. But basically this took, I think, five elite alchemists. So five people, mountaineers who are pretty experienced. They were going up to Everest. And what they did was they were looking at reducing their normal acclimatization time. So what they did was the usual time that took to actually get up on the mountain. They flew to Kathmandu and they got to the top of Everest. Um, well, they reached 7,500 meters five days after leaving base camp, which is super, super quick. So what they did here is they did a little bit of pre-climatization before in a um, hyperbaric attitude chamber, four days before leaving, 38 hours in total in a hyperbaric attitude chamber. And then they cut down that um, rate of ascent and they make a really, really short trip and they actually got there. So it was safe to say on this, with this very, very small study, that this type of attitude training was an effective way to pre-climatize them because it triggered a few particular mechanisms, such as increased hemoglobin concentration, allowing them to save a pretty significant amount of time on the mountain. So saving one to three weeks worth of acclimatization time. Super, super positive. And if that again says, if you can spend time in a hyperbaric attitude chamber before you go into an extreme attitude environment, that's going to help you cut down acclimatization time. That's going to help pre-climatize you. However, again, hyperbaric altitude is not commonly um, available to most people. And most of the companies offering these pre-climatization packages are not giving you a hyperbaric chamber. They're giving you a normal barrack chamber, which cannot be considered the same thing. So again, I've seen this study used to justify quite a few things, but it cannot be considered the same thing. So this one was a review which basically looked at the effectiveness of pre-climatization strategies for high altitude exposure. And it sort of looked at a whole bunch of different studies um, and it had a whole bunch of conclusions. Basically what it said towards the end, it had a whole bunch of different things, but it said pre-climatization strategies using hyperbaric hypoxia, which is attitude chamber in a hyperbaric environment or natural attitude were much, much, much more effective than normal barrack, hypo um, normal barrack hypoxia. There were some benefits to normal barrack stuff, but it had nowhere near the effects of the hyperbaric stuff. And it basically came out and said, normal barrack hypoxia and hyperbaric hypoxia treatments cannot be used interchangeably to reduce AMS and improve exercise performance during attitude. So what this is saying is what I've just been hammering home before. These three types of training cannot be considered the same thing. If you want to improve your time on the mountain, get up on a mountain or spend time in a hyperbaric environment. Normal barrack attitude training is not going to give the results that these studies have shown. So that is very, very, very important. I've sort of hammered this point home and I hope it's sunk in because it's so important for you to know. So in summary, um, simulated training in a hyperbaric environment has been shown to reduce the incidence of AMS and speed up your acclimatization. Amazing. 
training in a normal baric attitude chamber has been shown to reduce symptoms of attitude sickness, but only when spending prolonged time in a normal baric attitude chamber. There's been no testing around a hyperbaric environment or a reduced air pressure environment, or at least what I've seen so far. Um, there is no conclusive evidence to show that training in a normal baric attitude chamber will help prevent attitude sickness while at, out, um, at terrestrial attitude. None of the studies that we've looked at um, have shown a really major difference. And all the ones we've just talked about before, they were shown positive results for the hyperbaric environment. So why all the hype? Why are people so intent on pushing this and so stoked about it all? Now, number one, there's obviously the commercial thing where people are trying to make a living, they're trying to push their product. You need to be wary of people trying to sell anything, in all honesty, but hopefully you understand that now. But many, many, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of people going to doing this type of training, going on the mountain, feeling more comfortable, performing better. So where's all the hype coming from? Basically, simulated attitude training in a normal barrack, um, normal barrack environment or a hyperbaric environment can improve your endurance performance, can improve a m number of measures, which can be pretty, pretty effective. We're not going to go into too much detail here on that, but it has been shown to help improve your endurance performance. Now, exertion is a risk factor when it comes to attitude sickness. So if you can improve your endurance, you're going to have less chance of exertion when you're actually on the mountain for doing the same thing. And therefore, you're going to have less chance of attitude sickness. Pretty, pretty, um, pretty good news there. And there is a lot of anecdotal evidence that attitude training makes moderate attitude much more comfortable. So people, that when you're coming into about 3,000 or 4,000, maybe even 5,000, people are feeling a lot more comfortable. However, according to the anecdotal evidence, at least that's the first few days. And then as people sort of spend the amount of time in attitude, it all begins to catch up and people are equal footing. So when it really comes down to it, this type of training can be effective for endurance performance. It can be a little bit of an aid to help your endurance performance, but it's not directly going to help your risk of attitude sickness. If you want to improve your endurance performance, you can use this as a tool, but you could also train harder, train smarter, work with a coach, do a million and one other methods, which don't require this type of thing. So when should a hiker or mountaineer use simulated attitude training? When should you consider applying this into your training? In my opinion, it should be considered the sprinkles on top of the icing, on top of the cake, which is your training. Meaning, I highly recommend you make sure you're completing and nailing every single week your aerobic capacity development, which is basically hiking, your running, your cycling, however you're going about that, your strength training, your structured strength training, not a bodybuilding program, not a CrossFit program, but a mountaineer specific strength training program, which progresses over time, nailing your nutrition and your hydration, both in your day to day life and also gearing everything up for your trip, nailing your higher intensity training, so not your generic hit classes, not your CrossFit, but specific high intensity training for mountain years nailing your mobility work nailing your recovery then you can you could consider using simulated attitude training it's not going to be a fix all it's not going to be a magic bullet it's not going to be amazing if you're not actually tweaking off all these things so many um, mountaineers and alpinists have succeeded and performed very very well without this type of thing it can be an aid but it's not going to help reduce your risk of attitude sickness and it's not going to be worth your time if you're not ticking off all these things first so to wrap up don't get caught up in the hype if trying, someone's trying to push studies on you or trying to talk about things where they might not 100% know about. At least now you're empowered, now you're knowledgeable, now you understand the difference between these types of things. You actually understand what's going on when you go into these environments and you understand the difference between something you might see in a gym or might be able to hire a tent to what the studies are actually saying. If you're given evidence from someone, just ask what type of attitude it used in the study. If they cannot answer that, they don't know what they're talking about. If they cannot say it's hyperbaric, uh, if they cannot say it was using a normal baric environment to improve performance in a hyperbaric environment, it's probably not incredibly relevant for you. If you do want to learn a bit more about this, um, if you want to go into a bit more detail, feel free to reach out to me at rowan at summitstrength.com.au. Alternatively, if you do want to help your preparations, if you looked at that list before, which I talked out, and you're like, I'm not talking, I'm nailing all of these things. I don't even include my strength training. I don't know about anything about mobility training or anything like that. If you do need help with your preparations, you can look up the online summit program, which is my online personal training service for um, trekkers and mountaineers. You can go to summitstrength.com.au slash online. You can check it out there and you can have a look through the program and see if that is right for you. So thank you so much for watching today. I really do hope you got a bit out of this. Hopefully you got a good insight into what attitude training is going to be doing for you and whether or not to include in your preparations. So have a good one and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.